All right, good afternoon and welcome to City and State's latest online discussion on the coronavirus pandemic. Our topic today is the future of transit and transportation. I'm John Lutz, City and State's Editor-in-Chief. And before we again, begin, I'd like to thank our sponsors. Thank you to our sponsor, Boingo. For 20 years, Boingo has helped the world's leading transportation hubs navigate complex technological landscapes with connectivity solutions. As New York prepares to reopen, Boingo is here to help with wireless technology that will facilitate the new touchless passenger experience and beyond. We are proud to serve New Yorkers and remain New York tough. Thank you also to our sponsor, Cubic. Our teams at Cubic are committed to protecting healthcare professionals, first responders, transit agencies, military and restaurant personnel from COVID-19. We quickly shifted focus in response to COVID-19, established a working group, defined essential onsite operations and personnel, reviewed customer commitments, repurposed our manufacturing facilities and supply chain resources, and delivered more than 320,000 face coverings for New York MTA employees. Thank you for putting your trust in us as we navigate this challenging environment together. And our third sponsor, the Parkside Group. For the last 15 years, they have successfully represented Fortune 500 companies, advocacy groups, educational and cultural institutions, labor unions, and candidates for public office. On behalf of these clients, they have tackled complex public policy issues, won difficult political campaigns, and built powerful statewide coalitions. Parkside's team consists of a diverse group of seasoned professionals with decades of collective experience in public and strategic affairs. With offices in New York City and Albany, they battle daily at the crossroads of media, business, government, and politics. And I'll now turn it over to Evan Stavisky, a partner at the Parkside Group, who will make a few remarks and introduce today's panelists. Evan, over to you. Thanks, John. Really appreciate having the opportunity to chat, and thank you to all of our panelists. It, it's an incredibly timely topic that we're talking about today. When I began my professional career working for NYPIRG when it housed the Strap Hangers campaign back in the day, transportation was really its own discrete area of policy. Then as there became a growing understanding of climate change, transportation began to see a confluence of interest with environmental issues. But recently, the last few months, it became very clear that in a densely populated regions such as ours, and when we're dealing with a pandemic, there's just an intersection with public health issues as well. So, you know, what does that mean? How can people safely ride and also work in mass transit? Reimagining what our streets look like to reflect the fact that the city's fundamentally changed from a few months ago. So uh, it should be a great conversation today and we have some excellent panelists to help discuss that. So uh, I'd like to start off by introducing really a, a good friend of mine who I've known for almost 15 years since he was a young campaign staffer, but since then he's moved on to greater things, much greater things, being elected to the city council from the west side of Manhattan. And for the last several years, having been uh, the speaker of the city council, Corey Johnson. Under his leadership, really the council has a renewed sense of energy and vigor. It's exercising oversight. It's making tough choices in the budget uh, during this very difficult uh, budget uh, crisis that the city faces. And through all of those challenges, he's really known for his compassion. And even though he may have grown up in rural Massachusetts, he's really become a true New York personality. Um, we also have Philip Eng, uh, the president of the Long Island Railroad. Uh, he's a former official of the New York State Department of Transportation, where he helped play a leadership role in moving major infrastructure programs, such as the Kosciuszko Bridge, and he can tell me if I pronounce that correctly, uh, as well as the Mario M. Cuomo Bridge. Uh, Polly Trottenberg is the uh, commissioner of the New York City Department of Transportation. She worked as an aide to three United States senators, including the legend Daniel Patrick Moynihan and our senior Senator Chuck Schumer as an undersecretary of transportation in the Obama administration. And since becoming the DOT commissioner, she's been charged with leading Vision Zero, which is one of the de Blasio administration's most innovative and really most successful programs. Uh, and it's obviously saved lives and it's, often in politics that we would say that with a, with a little bit of hyperbole, but in this case, she's literally saved lives through Vision Zero. But now she's leading the efforts to transform city streets, which I'm sure we'll be talking about today. Uh, Doug Lauder is a senior vice president at Boingo, which provides high-speed high Wi-Fi and cellular services to airports, stadia, and other public places worldwide. And Ian Woodruff is a senior vice president of business development for Cubic Transportation Systems, 
which produces, markets, and operates fair reading and payment systems for transit systems throughout the world. So with that diverse group of experiences and uh, expertise, it should be a great discussion. So I'll turn it back over to you, John. Great, thank you, Evan, appreciate it. Uh, just one last note for our audience. There's a few functions on Zoom I'll point out. If you wanna ask a question, we're gonna try to take a few questions at the end. Click on the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. I uh, will take, uh, again, a few of those for the last five or 10 minutes or so. Uh, you can also interact with other attendees through the chat function. Uh, we encourage you to use the drop-down box to share comments with all attendees, uh, not just the panelists, as it'll be uh, by default. Uh, please keep that discussion civil and on point. And again, uh, any uh, questions you have, put that uh, through the Q&A function. Finally, uh, up at the top right-hand corner of your screen, you can change the view settings. Um, you can see all of us at once or kind of one at a time. Finally, back to our panelists, uh, a very open-ended question to kick it off for everyone. How will people be able to commute as New York City and New York State reopen? And council speaker, let's start with you. And you're on mute. We, uh, there we go. Can you hear me now? Yes. Great. Thank you, John. Uh, nice to see everyone. Hope everyone is safe and healthy. Uh, there's a lot I could say on this. I'm not going to speak for too long because I know we have a lot of uh, great panelists who want to weigh in. But I'll say that short term, we need to figure out how New Yorkers are going to get around safely. And long term, we need to use this opportunity and time to really think about what we want our transit options to look like in a post-coronavirus world, especially with the looming threat of climate change. We need a fast, reliable, sustainable transit network for the 22nd century. And we already started this work uh, together in passing the Streets Master Plan uh, last fall. Uh, but the pandemic, I believe, has really shown how important it is to be flexible and to be able to adjust our streetscape to fit new transit needs. So we have to keep working towards the goals of the Streets Master Plan. And in some areas, look to implement things like bus lanes and bike lanes even faster as people need more options to commute safely during the pandemic. And then the, the final thing I will say on this is uh, you know, we really need to be more proactive. I don't mean this uh, towards Polly, who I have a very good working relationship with and I think has done some wonderful things during her time as commissioner of DOT. I mean, the, the folks inside of the city hall uh, need to be a little more proactive in supporting some of the work that DOT is doing in giving them more leeway to actually come up with creative ideas and uh, not having the professionals at DOT be entirely under their thumb. We should be looking at Paris. What has Paris been doing during COVID-19? We should look at Tokyo and Hong Kong. We should look at other cities around the world and how quickly and nimbly they've been able to adapt to what this moment calls for and then take those opportunities and use that to inform what we do as we start to reopen, how we transform and change our transportation network. Great, thank you, Council Speaker. I'm glad you hit on uh, the, the global cities perspective. We'll be digging into that a little more deeply later in the discussion. Uh, but Commissioner Trottenberg, uh, next over to you. Right, let me unmute there. Um, and, and thanks, John and Evan, uh, for having us on this panel. And, and it's great to be with the speaker. And, and certainly, I think he has been a, a terrific leader on transportation and, and has certainly pushed DOT and, and the de Blasio administration to do more. And, and let me talk a little bit about what we are doing right now, because I think there's a lot of comparison to New York and other cities. And some of that comparison works. And, and sometimes it doesn't. We're, we're a much bigger city than Paris. but. You know, I think, and I'll give the speaker credit for this, he really pushed the city to, as he said, come up with a much more nimble model, for example, for what we're calling open streets. And we've now opened 45 miles of streets for recreation and cycling, including nine miles of temporary bike lanes, which we put up in about a week and a half, which for us is a, is a record. The mayor has announced we're doing 20 miles of bus lanes, something the speaker has also been a big champion of. I will just say there, just on a sort of, a note of reality, many of his colleagues are um, 
certainly wanting us to spend a lot of time, you know, going back and forth with them on a community consultation process. So that creative tension still exists. It took us about two years to do what has now become an iconic uh, busway that the mayor just announced will be permanent, which is 14th Street. Um, and I think we're hearing from a lot of, uh, you know, council members, even those that are big supporters of bus lanes, they acknowledge it shouldn't take two years, but I'm not sure they want it to take two weeks either. So finding that sweet spot uh, is one of the things we're continuing to work on. And then we're also working with the council on, um, as the city gets into phase two, opening up streets and sidewalk space for restaurants. And I think we'll, the mayor will have more to say on that this week, but I, I hope people will be pleased. I think it's going to be a, a very nimble and user-friendly approach that will do something I know we all care deeply about right now, trying to do everything we can to help, you know, our treasured and beloved uh, restaurant sector recover after uh, this terrible pandemic. Great, thank you, Commissioner. Uh, and then over to Long Island Railroad President Phil Eng, uh, getting the suburban perspective. Uh, what do you have to say? Thank you, John. And I think I echo what the speaker said and what Polly had said, um, you know, the, ability to provide transportation options to the public, um, both before the pandemic and now even more so during the, as we look through recover, um, is vital. And I think we've seen that it has to be a multimodal solution, right? The, the more options, um, the more options that are viable and reliable uh, and safe um, is going to be important. It's gotta be something where I think probably is a word nimble um, we, we've learned we can be nimble. We've made decisions as we saw, in, you know, in my case, ridership drop. And as we see some ridership coming back, we're, we're making decisions. Um, we're planning for them, but we also know that we have to be prepared to, to change from those plans because uh, of the way travel patterns will change. And businesses will um, help work with us in terms of dictating that type of thing, whether they have shifts, whether they have more telecommuting and they continue to telecommute. Um, you know, all of these things need to be factored in. And with regards to transit options, it touched on a little bit, but the, the importance of saying it's available, it's safe, it's, it's, we're doing everything we can to um, protect not only the people that choose to use our facilities, but also to protect our employees because we need them to be safe to be able to provide that reliable service. And all of these together will give the public as they come back to work, as the different phases um, start to take shape, um, I think a little level of um, more peace of mind, a little more confidence, um, because while many people at the height uh, chose to drive, uh, we know that driving is not going to be an option for everybody, and mass transportation or biking or walking or, or other means uh, have to play a role in this. And, and um, you know, those are the types of things that we're monitoring, and we're going to have to be nimble ourselves to, to support however the public chooses to use us. Great, thank you, President. And we also have two uh, private sector voices here uh, providing that perspective in the discussion. Um, first, uh, Doug, over to you. Uh, how would you answer that question? How are we gonna be commuting in this unprecedented environment? Sure, so, uh, you know, our perspective is slightly different than on the policy side, of course, and, uh, you know, providing technology to a variety of different transportation hubs globally. You know, we see what a lot of different entities are trying to figure out and, our perspective is more crowdsourced. So when you know when we're talking to our customers, we're trying to share information across different uh, airport authorities, transportation agencies, and so uh, what we're seeing predominantly, uh, especially uh, as the speaker said, internationally, where where airports tend to be privately owned and not government run, uh, we're we're seeing a heavy uh, diligence on technology as a solution to a lot of the challenges that COVID is going to bring. And so technology such as, um, you know, ways to track uh, density of a venue, uh, security checkpoints that are touchless uh, through biometrics and through, uh, you know, better uh, processing that's not, um, you know, as, as contact intensive, mobile concession ordering, uh, you name it. The, the, the big conversation, the big topic is how do we leverage technology to do things in a way that's that's going to create less interaction or less close proximity of people amongst each other. Uh, and uh, yeah, I, I, I think that's probably a fair, fair way to add. Great. Thanks, Doug. Uh, and then Ian, uh, from your perspective at Cubic. Yeah. Hi, everybody. Uh, great to be here. 
Um, we recently launched Project Rebound to be a thought leadership partner to cities, not just New York, but across the globe, as Corey mentioned, from France to London to uh, many places in the US. And what is possible from a technological perspective to help keep riders safe and get people back to work? Um, this isn't just about subways. This is one of the biggest questions in our revitalization. But the true state of multimodal options, as Phil said, from buses to bikes, scooters, ferries, car shares, and integrated choices. We're going to have to use every tool at our disposal to regain uh, regions residents back to work. Much has been said about maintaining social distancing, which is a very difficult thing to do on a mass transit uh, environment. This will require diverse stakeholders to do successfully. We can try and flatten the peak travel time, employers talking about staggering a workday, creating a four four day work day and allowing people to work from home. Um, once the city is really up and running again, it really comes down to the billions of micro decisions people make every day. And this will have a tremendous impact on the crowdedness of our systems. What route they take, when they take it, the subway they get on, if they choose to transfer to Union Square or Atlantic Avenue, for example, we have to find a way to impact those billions of decisions. Real-time passenger information, for example, can become a cornerstone of installing trust back into the system. We can use data analytics models, passenger counters to quickly and seamlessly commute passenger crowding via their app or other means like trip plans. We can also weave in incentives into the analytics to help uh, impact behavior. If you choose a less dense route, let's say, or if you choose to travel off peak, you can be issued with rewards redeemable for cups of coffee, Starbucks, or even discounted subway rides. In London, they call this the nudging principle. Removing touch points has been mentioned. Um, investments could be and should happen to discourage repeating touching of services. Um, obviously, one of the biggest could be uh, going cashless. But we cannot create two separate public transit realities, the banked and the unbanked. And COVID is no longer safe for the unbanked to wait in long queues, convert cash to card, et cetera. We've had great success scaling up retail networks across the world where riders can purchase and load cards, cash on the cards, reducing the need for long lines at the fare box. Removing touch points doesn't happen at the fare collection equipment though. We could leverage mobile technology and reduce the friction at the gateway. Uh, wireless technologies like RFID, Bluetooth, ultra wideband enabled smartphones can easily enable moving physical touch points from subway access. Staff can e even manage gates remotely and prevent overcrowding of virtual station controls, for example. If stations have two exits and six entry lanes on a gate line, a few busy trains uh, exit at once, uh, a person could quickly change the entry gates to exit to prevent overcrowding. So it's that sort of technology uh, along with leveraging uh, the omni systems in place that uh, we believe can help. Great, thank you, Anne. Uh, then let's uh, go a little bit further on the tech side. Um, and President Ang at Long Island Railroad, you just rolled out a new, I guess, new features on an app. Uh, they'll include um, new functionality, allowing users to choose less crowded cars, even before a train arrives at a station. Uh, talk about what what we have there um, how's it, is going to help with social distancing. Well, Ian is right about um, taking advantage of technology. Um, the, the, the upgrade to the train time app, which we rolled out today, um, does exactly that. And what we wanted to do is to give the people coming back, the people using the railroad, and we were working on this actually before COVID hit, but we also um, know it's not only valuable when you have record ridership, but it's really valuable now as people are looking for more space when they take mass transportation. Uh, so what this is doing is it's leveraging the data that we actually have on our electric train cars. It's the suspension system that um, takes the weight of the car with the loads of the passengers. And what we've done is we've taken that and instead of using it for acceleration and braking, which it still does, we're now using that to give real time information uh, to the phone, on the personal app, right in their hands. Um, every single car, the electric fleet, our M7, M9 fleet, has the ability to see um, how many people are on each train car. 
and it, it shows you where you are in our system, all 124 stations where you're standing on a platform. And you can see if that train is going to platform in front of you with a car that has 50% ridership in it, or if you're standing in front of a car that has 35 or less percent of the seats taken. And then you could walk up or down the platform and then enter into a car um, that gives you more space. And that's in real time. Um, we're proud that we're able to do it. Um, and the other things, it's, it's the, the ability for now, the customer, the riders to come back and say, um, I want to take this train. Can I find a seat? Yes, you can. In the 12 car contest, you can walk to the back end of a car and there's multiple seats, whereas perhaps if you're near the front, it's not. Um, it's also going to have other things such as push notifications. So when you're waiting in your system, whether it's Penn Station or others, we'll be able to tell you on your phone immediately what track that train is coming in. Um, and people don't have to now stand around the board. So what we've done is we've leveraged things that we were working on before the pandemic and we're able to put it out there. And then the other part tied to uh, the Omni system uh, Cubic is working on for us, but also tied to our ongoing ETICs is really encouraging people to use the existing mobile ticketing system in their, in their device as well. Again, you could avoid using our ticket machines, you can minimize touch points, you can minimize and shorten the time, contact time on the trains. All of these things go a long way, but I think at the end of the day, it does go back to the riders and to the public whether you're in transportation system or you're at home, really practicing good habits. And that means good hygiene, washing your hands, sanitizing, because we can only disinfect touch points so many times a day. Um, so you really have to fall back on a lot of the measures that people are doing, um, whether you're working or not through the last three months. And uh, two quick follow-ups for you before I go back to the commissioner and the council speaker uh, in, in kind of more of the New York City specific perspective. But, um, I don't, you know, you obviously don't run Metro North, but we had a couple of questions from the audience already. Um, do you know if Metro North might adopt a similar system? Have, have, is this kind of a technology you would share with them? We've been sharing. We're working with uh, Metro North. We're working with our MTAIT folks with regards to this technology. Um, and it's, it's one of the things that um, we had the luxury that we were working on this, uh, like I said, um, over a year before this pandemic. But certainly the ability to share the information across the MTA family is something we've been doing. Um, you know, just as right now, transit is piloting ultraviolet uh, with regards to fighting the pandemic and killing the virus. You know, it's, I think that's the beauty of the, the size of MTA and the ability that we have to share best practices across. And not just within MTA family, but across the industry. So absolutely, we're working with them. Then one last question for you right now. Um, the MTA chairman, Pat Foy, at one point raised the possibility of, of having technology like Ticketmaster, reserved assigned seating, um, and that, that maybe that would work better on the commuter rail than say in the subways. Um, any updates on that possibility on Long Island? Well, I think we've seen the intercity rail, Amtrak, those things that have reservation systems, their systems were equipped for that type of um, capability. Commuter rail like Metro North, Long Island Railroad, or, or the transit system, um, because these are open systems and because of um, just the way um, we're required to uh, operate our trains. And it, it's a much greater operational challenge. It's not that you couldn't implement a system to sell tickets for a particular train, but operationally it, it is problematic. I think what we've worked on with regards to the ability for real-time information and what we're going to do is take that data now and we're going to be able to provide historical data to people. So as you're planning a trip, I could be looking for a trip next week. I could look and say that train that I'm interested in taking over this last week has had X ridership and the train after that has more space. So there's ways that we can leverage this. And I referenced uh, earlier, you know, it's, it's reservation like reservation light. It's, but it's not actually saying that this is your ticket for that train and that seat. Um, but what it is, is giving the, the rider important information so they can make decisions on which train to take. And then when you're in the system, you can make decisions on which car to take. So it's, it really is powerful. Um, and I think it is, is something that is best suited for systems where um, operation challenges uh, with regards to reservations are, are, are problematic. And at some point, mass transportation is, is um, it does need to move a lot of people uh, because it's, it is, it's designed for that and a lot of people rely on it. Um, so to limit the amount of people that can take a system 
um, particularly in a commuter railroad where perhaps the frequency of a train is not as, as um, robust as, as uh, mass transportation like subways. But um, all of these things, I think we're, we're working together across the MTA family are gonna be ways that we're gonna continue to provide improved tools, technology for our riders. Uh, and that goes in concert with all of the uh, other measures that are ongoing with regards to disinfecting train cars every day, disinfecting the stations twice a day and continuing to try new methods of uh, longer term antimicrobials that could perhaps kill for longer ter uh, terms. Sure. Hey, John, can, I, can I add a comment there just really quick? So uh, I'd, I'd be remiss being Boingo if I didn't comment on, you know, both the topics Ian brought up as well as Phil, uh, you know, to achieve real time data information to make it actionable you really have to get out in front of the connectivity piece of that, right? The, the devices have to connect in order for the data to reach where it's being processed and then distributed back out to the mobile device uh, and the mobile app. So I know MTA, Phil, has been way out in front of this, uh, especially with Eastside Access and Long Island Railroad. Uh, Boingo's working on a few of those projects with Phil. Uh, so is the Port Authority uh, under leadership of Rick Cotton and especially Rob Galvin. Uh, the new LaGuardia is very technically enabled, very connected. Uh, so I think it's, you know, not speaking specifically about New York, but just in general, when thinking about policy of, of capturing data, analyzing it and providing information to nudge people, as Ian said, you, you really have to make sure the foundation's in place and the foundation really becomes connectivity, so. Okay, thank you, Doug. Uh, Commissioner, um, at the New York City level, are there any technologies that are being developed or, or being considered, maybe one or two you'd want to flag uh, that will help us respond to this crisis? Uh, definitely, and I'll key off of what Phil was talking about. When the pandemic hit, I discovered the two parts of my agency that were most on the front lines. One would be very intuitive, which is the Staten Island Ferry, which is you know a small piece of New York City's own transit system. The second piece was the people who go out and collect the money and service our parking meters. It turns out they were on the front lines as well. and. I think we're striving to do part of what the MTA and, and, and sounds like Phil is talking about at Long Island Railroad, which is how do we make these systems much more contactless? And I know we have Cubic and, and some of the technological experts here. I mean, we sort of realize I have a massive, um, you know, crew of people who go out, you know, every morning to collect all these coins out of these parking meters. It's a very kind of anachronistic system. And now we're looking to very much advanced technologies that can make that much more cashless. We have a pay by sell system. We made some improvements to it, uh, you know, a couple months ago to try and make it more user friendly and affordable. But, you know, while addressing the question of the unbanked, I think for a lot of us, how do we make these systems, you know, far more contactless and retrofitting on our ferries and our terminals so that, you know, restrooms in every other part of our facilities can be contactless and, and continually cleaned as I think the MTA has done a terrific job on. So some of the things we're, we're starting to look at now. Thank you, Commissioner. And Council Speaker, as the Commissioner said, you, you have been pushing DOT to be more innovative and forward thinking. Um, any technologies you would like to see the city uh, explore or adopt uh, that might help uh, deal with this crisis? Before I answer that question, John, I, I was remiss earlier, and I think it's always important for us to do this. Uh, we lost a lot of transit workers from COVID-19. Uh, we lost uh, a lot of subway conductors and people that work uh, in our mass transit system uh, throughout the MTA. <clears throat> I know the number was over 125, but maybe more than that. And I know DOT lost folks, every city agency lost folks. And I think it's really important that we not uh, forget them and forget that, that at the height of this pandemic, when essential workers were trying to get to grocery stores, if they were a cashier or a food stalker or a nurse trying to get to a hospital, our transit system was running. And it was because of these brave women and men who kept it going. And I really want to remember them and thank them. And they need to get line of duty benefits uh, for uh, their families. So I really want to just mention that, that these transit workers have really gone above and beyond as have all of the essential workers. Uh, and I think it's really important to recognize them. Uh, on technology, you know, I'll just say as someone who has uh, never owned a car my entire life, 
Uh, and before I became speaker, I didn't have access to a car. I was a you know daily uh, subway rider, and I still try to take as, as often as I can. I took the bus as well. That for me, when minor things would happen uh, as a rider, I would feel super excited. So what do I mean by that? Just the countdown clock saying when the train is coming in the station, I think made such a difference for New Yorkers that they know they had you know either four minutes to wait or they had 23 minutes to wait. Four minutes, everyone felt good. 23 minutes, an enormous amount of rage. So I think figuring out ways to communicate to people information that's happening, there has been a partnership uh, and Polly, if she wants to get into it, can talk about how it's sort of been difficult in some ways where the last few years we have tried to put in bus countdown clocks throughout the city on different bus corridors by using GPS data on the buses to let folks know when the bus is actually coming. Uh, you know, on 14th Street where we now have the busway or on 23rd Street where we don't have a busway, we have select bus service, uh, you on many days could walk across 14th Street uh, faster than the bus could actually make it across 23rd Street or 14th Street or these major thoroughfares. So, you know, getting that technology that communicates with uh, riders in a real time way, I think is really important. And the last thing I just want to mention, which is a little unrelated, but I also think important for any, uh, for any conversation on transportation, we need to make sure our transportation is accessible. We need to make sure that uh, disabled New Yorkers, New Yorkers that have mobility impairments, that whatever we are planning on doing works for them. When we are doing capital projects, when we are redesigning routes, when we are fixing streets for bus, for bus routes, are we making sure the curb cuts exist? We need to make sure we have an accessible transportation network. And that is why the fast forward plan was so important to upgrade subway stations across New York City to make them accessible for New Yorkers who, cur who currently can't use so much of our transportation network. Sure. Thank you, Council Speaker. Um, I wanted to shift gears a little bit. Um, a couple of you mentioned, I think, the psychological aspect. At, at what point Will commuters feel comfortable getting back in a subway, uh, getting back on the commuter rail? Um, how do you how do you regain that confidence? And and kind of a second part to that question, what is the risk that we see a huge spike in car usage, and, and what kind of impact uh, will that have uh, on the downstate area broadly? I'll note that I think the CDC just issued guidance earlier this month that in fact uh, encouraged driving, um, encouraged people to drive alone. Uh, and, and that was uh, somewhat controversial. Uh, so I guess, Commissioner, if we could start with you, um, response to both of those points. And, and I would certainly say there were a lot of us who were very critical of what the CDC uh, was proposing. It, it seemed to go against everything we're trying to do in urban transportation. And I, I, I think everyone on this panel would agree. I know the speaker agrees. I mean, our city, if we're going to come back to our full strength, we're going to need you know, to, to rely on our mass transit system. The, the speakers heard me give this statistic. I like to give it because it's such an important reminder of how important that system is. Back when we were working on the 14th Street busway and all the things around the L train closure, a statistic I used to give is the L train, that one subway line out of many subway lines carries more people in the morning rush hour from eight to nine, this is pre-COVID obviously, more people in the morning rush hour between eight and nine a.m. than the six East River Bridge crossings, than the Brooklyn Battery Tunnel, the Brooklyn Bridge, the Manhattan Bridge, the Williamsburg Bridge, the Queens Midtown Tunnel, and the Queensboro Bridge. That is how efficient our subway system is. And so, you know, it, it, it's not going to be a solution to have everybody take to their cars, obviously. The, the, our, our city streets could never handle it. And, and I think you're hearing the discussion today about things we want to do for people who are looking for alternatives, particularly improving bus service and potentially you know, building out much more bike lanes very quickly. And I, I think I've seen in sort of the chats, the questions coming up of city bike and other forms of micro mobility. I'm happy to say that during this pandemic period, we have continued to work with Lyft, who's been a great partner. We've been expanding the city bike system up, uh, up into the rest of Manhattan, into the South Bronx, looking to do infill stations in Manhattan and expanding membership, including giving a lot of uh, one-year complimentary members to healthcare workers and 
frontline workers. I think just John, just sort of one final point. I think one question we're getting a lot of is, might the city have to do some demand management things though, if nonetheless people don't want to get back into the subways and they start to get into their cars. And, and New York has a history of that. If you look after Hurricane Sandy and 9-11 and, and some of the, the transit strikes of, of history, the city has tried different things, HOV lanes and, and other things like that. And we were obviously all working together on congestion pricing um, for, before COVID hit. So I think there's a discussion underway of, of potential demand management solutions as well. I don't think anyone's totally decided what those might look like, but it, it, it's certainly something the city's thinking about. Sure. And, and Council Speaker, you've, you've really been uh, at the forefront of pushing for street closures and, and, and making changes that are pedestrian friendly. Uh, any, any thoughts to add from your perspective? Well, you know, I think we need to, um, I was disappointed that a couple of weeks ago when the mayor was asked about the reopening uh, and fears that we may end up having a Carmageddon where people avoided buses and subways, what would happen to our city streets? He sort of said, well, people will adapt. And, and that's not what we should be. I, I, I know, um, not that I speak for Polly Trottenberg, but uh, I think she probably doesn't think people will adapt. We have to go with plans for people. We have to give people options. We have to make people feel safe. We have to, we have to allow uh, creative ideas. And so the councils tried to do that. We did that pre-pandemic with the Master Streets Plan. We did that in pushing for the open streets across New York City, which DOT has been implementing. We did that in pushing and having a hearing and introducing legislation on opening up sidewalks and street space and plazas for restaurants, as Polly mentioned at the beginning of this conversation, and DOT is implementing that plan with sister agencies like the Department of Consumer Affairs and the Department of Health. So we need to be doing these things. And one area that I would just highlight is uh, buses. I think to go back to what uh, Polly just referenced, I think the CDC guidelines that were mentioned were unworkable and irresponsible for a city like New York City to say avoid mass transit and get in your car. And that struck a lot of fear in New Yorkers to be getting that guidance from the CDC. So what should we be doing? What we've seen, and, and one of uh, Commissioner Trottenberg's predecessors, Jeanette Sedek Khan, had an article in The Atlantic uh, last week uh, mentioning how there has been a lot of fear mongering about mass transit in cities across America. And what we've seen from cities across the globe as they've reopened mass transit and what that has looked like. Some places what has worked, other places what, haven't, what hasn't worked. We need to use those models and learn from them. But on buses, people have seemed to be more comfortable using buses than subways at this point. Subway ridership has gone up, but bus ridership has really gone up. So what does that mean? That means we really need to increase capacity so that more buses can actually be running so that they are not as crowded. And we need to make sure that we are opening up uh, more bus lanes. We can do that uh, in a fast tracked approach way while still talking to community members uh, on, on what their concerns are, but also understanding we need to get these things done quickly. So I, I think we need to focus right now on some of those things. I know Polly is working on that. I know her team is working on that. They have been good partners on the sidewalk initiative for restaurants. They have been good partners on the open streets uh, initiative. And I know they're working on identifying uh, bus lanes. And the last point I'll make is, and again, this is not me taking a dig at DOT, it's just something that I think we can improve on. We've seen other temporary bike lanes across the world that have been set up, I think, in a really smart, interesting, creative, well-marked way. Here, the temporary bike lanes are not that. They're a little, uh, depends on where you go, but you, have, you see bicyclists tweeting every single day how they're not really working in the way that they should be. So I think we need to use this opportunity to look at what other cities are doing, try to uh, remake it here if possible. I know New York City is different, but we can still try and, and see what is successful, see what's not successful, and use that in our future implementation of proactive 22nd century 
transit priorities and implementation. Doug or Ian, anything to add? I, I, I would chime in just real quick as a, as a technology executive. Uh, we've been pleasantly surprised with how well our workforce has adapted to the distribution of place. We have big offices in, in New York and Los Angeles and Chicago. And with those shutting down pretty rapidly and under immediate pressure, uh, we've been really surprised at how well the company has been able to execute. And I think, you know, just talking to other technology executives, my peers, uh, we're, there's likely going to be a larger work from home population than there was pre-COVID. And so I think there are going to be opportunities to incentivize that as well through some policy and to, you know, especially folks who are, you know, leaning towards driving, uh, maybe encourage, you know, companies to not bring as many people into the city every day or do, you know, uh, chop it up and do some distribution. So, you know, some people come on Monday, some people come on Tuesday. So I think there's, there's going to be some good uh, public private opportunities where policy could steer and help mitigate some of the congestion. Yeah. Yeah, and a comment from myself. Um, we spoke about um, you know many more bikes on the on the roads at the moment, and uh, you know acknowledging that uh, the administration has done more to make the city bike friendly. Um, we we've had or well, we've seen that uh, ninety percent of the bike crashes happen at the intersection. Um, we acquired a company a few few years ago, and we've seen a, an uptick in that technology. Um, to actually identify when bikers are in the intersection so that signals can be accommodated or, or alerts given. Also, we can look to, to maybe uh, how to integrate uh, some of the, the, the bike schemes into, um, into Omni digital solutions to help bike protectors at crucial moments, et cetera. Great, thank you. And then, uh, Philip Eng, I wanted to ask you, um, you know, uh, I guess in terms of people working at home uh, and, and maybe there'll be a, a somewhat permanent shift long-term, uh, a point that Doug raised, uh, what does that mean for the Long Island Railroad? More broadly, how do you set service levels? Obviously you want, you want more commuters to bring in revenue that's needed. Uh, you don't want overcrowding. I know on the Metro North, there was a, I think a, a standoff over, um, uh, I guess the conductors were unhappy uh, with there not being enough trains and they are worried about overcrowding and their own health. Uh, how do you take all those different factors and figure out here's where we're going to set our uh, service levels for the Long Island Railroad? Well, John, right now, <clears throat> you know, one of the things that we want to do is to um, monitor the ridership that, that we've seen. And obviously when it started dropping, you know, the decision was to reduce our ridership, but to reduce it to levels that enabled us to allow the people that had to work, the essential workers that were helping to fight the pandemic, the ability to not only have sufficient trains to choose, um, but also ability if they choose those trains that they can spread out during this pandemic. And we did that, you know, even though our ridership dropped to um, <clears throat> at, at the lowest points, we lost 97% of our ridership on a weekday, uh, we still maintained 70% of the trains uh, because <clears throat> those folks were not just traveling during one hour, they were traveling throughout the day. And it was important to give people enough time to do that. But as we started to now support the phase one of Long Island, the phase one of New York City, phase two of Long Island, uh, we wanted to be ahead of it. We wanted to ensure that as people come back, and again, a lot of this is giving them that sense of comfort. Um, we wanted to make sure that we had uh, even more trains for that. So what we were doing is um, during the initial reduction in service. Uh, we always had people monitoring ridership and changing travel patterns, whether people were, as you say, more working from home and, and continue to work from home even during these early phases. Uh, we had protect trains across the island. So we saw particular trains uh, or people um, perhaps crowding. What we would do is we'd message and we'd run a protect train. Uh, we lengthened the cars where we felt necessary. Uh, but then on the, the first day of New York City phase one, we ramped up service back to about 90% of our normal weekday service. Uh, and we're seeing that people can um, currently effectively spread out, 
give themselves space in the trains. And while we'd love to have more ridership back, we're really running service now for essential workers. That's our priority right now. Uh, we still have a long way to go. We're very happy that the economy is restarting, but we also want people to realize that um, we could probably slip backwards very quickly. And all of this is tied to um, us adjusting how we monitor things. So some of the things we talked earlier about with the, the real-time train loading, that historical data, that will also give us information with regards to um, how we continue, whether it stays at 90%, whether we continue to need a 12-car train, perhaps we can shorten that to 10 cars. And all of that will help us in the workforce because um, the less cars we're running, the ability for us to rest our workforce, they've done tremendous um, efforts to continue to deliver the service that we have. Um, and I know the speaker spoke earlier, the MTA family um, had a lot of um, uh, pain and suffering, but they continued to come in every day uh, across all of our agencies to deliver uh, the critical service that helped us get to where we are. Uh, so all of these decision points, the ability, uh, and that ties to infrastructure work too, the ability to not only run the service, but run it reliably. So we've been continuing to focus on maintenance, inspection, uh, state of good repair. And that's not just here, but I know my sister agencies are doing the same because when people are riding the system, not only do they know we're disinfecting at a level that we've never done before, but we're running reliable service. And that's important too, right? That, that if you get on that train, um, more, you know, the, the likelihood and the reliability of that trip is high. And, and all of us have worked very hard to improve that. So all of these different factors are, are crucial. Um, but then it's, following and monitoring what the businesses are doing. And, and we've heard it and we're, we're gonna to continue to watch whether or not it's the normal um, travel west into the city in the morning or, or east in the, um, the PM to go home. Uh, we've been building towards major infrastructure things like third track, east side access. And that's not only important in the pre-COVID world, but I think in the future because we may see and we're, we're ready for, that's what we're working towards, reverse commutes and, and how do we support a changing travel pattern? And it's, it's evolving. Um, we need to be nimble and I know the ridership will continue to um, look at alternatives and, and that's why all this discussion regarding all the transportation partners, the technology partners um, and, and working with private sector is, is gonna be a collaborative effort and everyone has to really um, stay on top of the different topics to, to be able to be uh, mobile and nimble. Sure. And on the, on the point of the psychology of the commuter and, and getting comfortable with getting back in the system, uh, I just had two other things. This came up from some audience questions. Um, how do you enforce social distancing? Is it, is it just kind of trusting everyone to be good actors or, or do there need to be some kind of recourse if people are you know, not maintaining distance? And then separately, a question of contact tracing. Uh, you know, there's, there's technology there, I think, that, that you could do uh, tracking of, of who's on the trains and who's not, should there be an outbreak? Uh, there are privacy questions, obviously. Uh, anyone want to hit on either of those issues? Well, I, I'll just talk a little bit about the enforcement of social distancing. Um, you know, early on during the um, early stages when we reduced the train service, um, one of the things we focus very hard is, is customer public messaging um, because what we saw is that um, some people would come down the staircase and get onto the same train car every day, but if they just walked down the platform for two cars, they had the ability to actually have, uh, in some cases, uh, uh, many seats between them and other riders. Um, so what we did is over time with the messaging on platforms in social media, um, through email text alerts, we saw that the public actually did change their habits too. They, they started to walk just outside here in Jamaica. I, I observed how people would walk down the platform and they were spreading out themselves. So uh, a lot of this goes back to people um, understanding the, the options, um, the facts, and the ability to um, help themselves do this, right? It's not just us being able to put decals down everywhere to help identify these distances, but people are uh, being very courteous to each other. The face coverings, they are wearing face coverings predominantly. Uh, and that's an important part. A lot of this is not just when they're in the transportation system, but it's really what you're doing in other parts of your life as well, whether you're out uh, with the family, um, 
now that you can have outdoor dining, um, you know, how do you, how do you protect yourselves there when you walk into those facilities? How do you, how do you protect yourself when you're out buying groceries? Um, it's, it's really practicing those habits because at some point, at least in the Long Island Railroad and, and the MTA, you know, it's, it is um, social distancing is not going to be possible necessarily in the future, but the information we're providing on our new app will allow people to be able to make informed decisions on which trains, which cars to take. Um, and I think historical data like that will, will go a long way as well. Uh, John, I'll just say on, on this, I mean, I don't think we should be using police officers to enforce social distancing. Uh, we saw the really glaring disparities in enforcement uh, before George Floyd was murdered uh, a few, you know, about a month ago uh, when you had the vast majority of summonses and arrests on quote unquote social distancing enforcement be uh, against black and brown people in New York City. And meanwhile, uh, in my own district, there have been plenty of people who have not been doing social distancing in the way they should be. My district is overwhelmingly uh, white. Uh, we've seen it in the Hudson River Park and we don't need the police to do that. So I think there are other ways. The other ways is you come up with a plan. You come up with, with a system that works. So what does that mean? Phil just talked about on trains. Could you have uh, MTA workers uh, be doing capacity checks at the gate so that you only let a certain number of people in, so you're not letting too many people in? Uh, could you have ambassadors out there that are actually giving out masks to people and uh, you have the pro appropriate signage? Uh, these are the things I think you need to do because we have seen that if you police these things, there is always, and there always has been, a disproportionate level of over-policing against communities of color. We saw it before George Floyd was murdered here in New York City. We saw it during stop, question, and frisk uh, during the Bloomberg years. And I don't think that is the way out of this. The way out of this is come up with a plan, a plan that works, give out masks equitably, especially in neighborhoods that are low income neighborhoods or neighborhoods where they don't have access to these type of things. Put in community leaders and ambassadors to actually be able to spread the message on what this looks like. Those are some of the things that I think we need to do. Heavy handed law enforcement to enforce this doesn't work. One of the most galling incidents that we saw, well, two incidents, again, before George Floyd was murdered, was a, uh, I believe she was either an African-American or Latino mother who was in a subway station who was basically tackled by some police officers for uh, not having, she had a mask, it just wasn't over her face. Uh, and that was their enforcement on her, even though she was walking away and there was no one around her. And we saw on the Lower East Side, a young man, a young, uh, I think he was a Latino man, uh, who was sat on top of by a police officer, uh, you know, and, and totally uh, over the top, uh, you know, policing, uh, wrong. Um, so this is what you see if you start to use law enforcement on these type of things. We should use ambassadors, we should have a plan, we should do capacity uh, issues. Those are the things that we should do. But following up, um, both for you, uh, Council Speaker and, and Commissioner, um, I believe it's just in December, the MTA board voted to place 500 more police officers in the transit system. The governor and the MTA said that they were needed to address crime, fair evasion, and the growing homeless population. Uh, I, I just want to say, John, on that, I don't support that. And at the time, I didn't support it. So when that was announced, I spoke out against those 500 additional officers. They're not NYPD officers, they're MTA police officers. And I spoke out about it at that time because you're not gonna solve the homeless issue in New York City, both on the streets of New York City or on our subways through policing. You're gonna solve it through housing, permanent affordable housing and supportive housing. You're gonna solve it through access to mental health services. You're gonna solve it through getting social workers and crisis counselors. That's how you're gonna solve it. You're not gonna solve it 
through policing homeless people. And so I was against it then when it was announced many months ago, and I'm against it now. Commissioner, anything from you on that? Um, you know, I think I was against it too, for that, for that matter. I don't think the MTA should be spending their precious operating funds on that policing. I will say for this city, there's obviously been a big evolution. Um, it was only a few years ago that the city council voted to actually add 1300 police to the force, which I wasn't for that either. So obviously the city is seeing a profound evolution in how it views policing. Um, I think the mayor has already announced, I hope that the speaker caught this, uh, no more policing on social distancing. And in fact, the city is sending, I think it's about 800 folks to do exactly what he's saying, which is to go be ambassadors in the subway stations. We're working closely with the MTA on that. The city has done, I think, multi, multi millions of, of uh, mass giveaways. Totally agree that that is an absolutely essential thing the city should be providing folks who want to come into the transportation system. And I think there's pretty useful universal agreement now. By the way, I think NYPD is enthusiastic about getting out of the social policing game as well. The, the incidents that the speaker talked about, I know they didn't feel proud of those and you know would be happy not to have that as an assignment. And I'll just say, John, John, just to respond, I'll just say, I said it uh, last week when we had a hearing on the police accountability bills uh, that the council is passing this week. Uh, and I'm not going to uh, go into a long explanation, but just to say, uh, I was wrong on those 1,300 officers. I wasn't speaker at the time. I was a council member, but I was wrong. Uh, you know, we need to re-envision what public safety looks like, what policing looks like. Uh, and the conversation has uh, evolved very quickly, as Commissioner Trottenberg just said. I think one of the important things in this moment, especially for white people, is to normalize saying when we were wrong and not making excuses. So I was wrong. I was wrong in not understanding at that moment in time that there are other ways to invest in public safety. I wasn't part of those negotiations because I wasn't speaker of the city council, but I still take responsibility for my vote because I was a member of the city council. That vote happened in 2015. Uh, since then, I think we've done some good things, but still I was wrong and I'm not gonna make excuses for it. I'm gonna apologize for it because that's what I think this moment calls for in our history, in our city, and to be able to move forward in a thoughtful way. And President Ang. Um, yeah, I wanted to say, you know, um, the speaker talked about ambassadors and, you know, I'm really proud of what we've done here at MTA and on Long Island Railroad, working with our labor partners here at the railroad. We, we repurposed and reinvented how our ticket station folks would work. And rather being behind the glass right now, they're, they're out and about roaming the stations. They're working on supporting social distance. They're working on assisting customers that need help. They're selling tickets um, as they're mobile, but they're also doing things such as uh, providing hand sanitizer at our stations, handing out masks to people who need it. And in, it's in a way of encouraging and supporting um, not only the essential workers that have been coming in already, but the new ones to the system. Um, very proud of how that is working. And not only here at Long Island Railroad, but I know my sister agencies at New York City Transit, Metro North, we're doing very similar things. Um, and it is an effective tool in terms of really encouraging the habits that we want the riders, the public to do. Um, and it's, it's, it is a positive effect. So those types of things are events. And then they feed back to us to help us, have, again, better plan service, to better plan the needs and, and really look um, not just for what's happening today, but how do we handle things as the, the next phases continue to move forward. John, um, I wouldn't mind just uh, responding to what uh, Corey's great uh, suggestions about gate lights. Um, we, we can already take that information and pass it back on the number of taps that are happening at each gate light uh, or indeed on, on board the buses. Um, this way you can use to, to manage the flow of riders accessing stations or going down to train level. Um, you can do this by passing you know, messages uh, back through their apps to say why not get uh, on the station before or get off the station after where there's less queues, etc. cetera. Um, we've also seen some trials around the world where QR codes are, are put on vehicles where um, a, a rider can actually 
uh, scan the QR code to, to, to let uh, MTA or an authority know that they're on that vehicle. So should there be any, uh, any scare, they can be contacted uh, in the future. Um, so safeguarding their health. One thing I would add there too is, um, you know, we leverage various technologies to monitor things like uh, TSA checkpoints and queue times and social distancing in those lines and how far apart people can be based on various sensors and cameras. And what we've seen is in places like New York, uh, especially New York, where uh, the virus impacted, you know, heavier than other places in the country. Uh, there's a lot of self-enforcement, so we're actually seeing people without too much oversight uh, self-select to keep distance and, and to follow nudges that are in place, uh, despite what, you know, may have failed in the past. It now seems to be resonating in places like New York and L.A. and San Francisco. Um, but the one thing I would add to that for the policymakers is, you know, when tourism picks back up, uh, we are not seeing this in certain parts of the country. There's, there's a reluctance to, to self, uh, uh, self uh, you know, select into social distancing. So it will require leadership of the policymakers. It'll require leadership of New Yorkers to demonstrate the policies or to demonstrate the social distancing. So when tourists arrive in New York, uh, when that becomes normal again, that they will follow the lead of the New Yorkers. And so I would just encourage everyone to think through tourism as an aspect of this, because uh, it's not the same everywhere in this country, certainly not everywhere in the world. Sure. And uh, I want to hit on one final topic before we go to audience questions. Just a note for the audience, um, we have 64 audience questions. I don't think we'll be able to get to all of them, um, but you can give a thumbs up to questions you like, and it'll move it up to the top of the queue. Uh, for consideration. So again, anyone that wants to go through um, either add a question or like a question, uh, it'll move it up to the top. Um, I do want to hit on, we've, we've talked about subways, commuter rail, um, buses. Um, I think uh, just a couple other ones I just want to touch on briefly. You know, the city's looked at doing a streetcar for some time. I, I don't expect that's happening. Uh, there's a ferry system. Uh, I guess bikes in particular, is there any plan to expand city bike deeper into the, the outer boroughs given where we're at, Commissioner? Right, I mentioned that and I saw someone had a, had a question on what infill was. I mean, we are in the process right now working with Lyft who is so far making good on their commitment to invest a hundred million dollars in our system to basically double its size. We just, this summer for the first time, we've started installing city bike stations in the South Bronx. We're gonna get all the way up uh, into the northern end of Manhattan, further out into Brooklyn and Queens. But the infill part that I mentioned is as your system expands, bikes still have a tendency to gravitate towards the center of the city, towards the Manhattan Central Business District. So as you expand into the outer boroughs, you also have to keep adding more station capacity in the central Manhattan area. So that's another piece of what we're doing. And as I mentioned, working with Lyft and actually also with um, City and MasterCard, we've been offering year long free memberships to frontline workers, healthcare workers, doing particularly big station installations in key hospitals. So we're certainly gonna be continuing to do that process aggressively. Um, City Bike has proved to be sort of speaking of parts of the transportation system that have worked well. City Bike has proved to be really an amazing service during this period and even has, you know, transportation has dropped in a lot of other modes. We've seen on the weekends now in particular record ridership on City Bike. Sure. And then one other question, uh, e-bikes, e-scooters, uh, I believe state legislation finally passed this year legalizing that. If I understand correctly, it's, it's up to local municipalities to uh, put the details in place. I guess where are we at in New York City? And, and there's a secondary question about whether uh, e-scooter shares should be allowed in the city in Manhattan. Uh, Commissioner, any update on, on those issues? Well, I, I think I would first defer to the, to the speaker because that is something that actually the state legislature has granted cities the option to do uh, e-scooters and e-bikes, but it, it also involves council action. So, and, and we've certainly been talking to the council. Yeah, we've been in conversations with the commissioner and her team, and I believe you will see legislative action on this pretty soon. We have to get through the budget over the next, you know, 14 days, but this has been something that we are looking at. There is a, 
a bill, I believe, by Council Member Fernando Cabrera, uh, who has a bill on this, and uh, you know we we want to move forward. So we're going to look at what the state legislature allowed us. I'll just be totally candid and honest. I am so sort of overwhelmed at the moment with budget related stuff. I'm not remembering every detail of what the state allowed us and what the bill says, but I'll say that there is wide support in the council for it. We're gonna be working with Polly and her team on what implementation looks like and come up with a uh, plan that works for New York City while still abiding by the, of course, limits that the state legislature put in. I believe, I'm just, again, remembering from like a year ago, I think the legislature said some of these things can't happen in Manhattan, but they can happen outside of Manhattan. So we have to abide by those things and we'll work with DOT on what that actually looks like. But you will see movement on this uh, once the budget process is over. And I'll, I'll just, I know Mr. Speaker has a much bigger world than I do. Mine is just transportation. So just focusing on what the state allows us to do. At the city's option, we can legalize e-bikes and e-scooters. Um, the state banned them banned um, e-scooters in Manhattan and also along the, the Hudson River Greenway. But the city is, as the speaker mentioned, Council Member Cabrera had a bill that was actually pre the state's action that would allow the city to conduct a, a pilot program of, of shared scooters like you see with a, with a city bike. And so obviously we, as the speaker mentioned, we we're talking to the council about what that would look like. Um, and you know, potentially if a bill is passed, how we would implement it. But I think it's something we're all very interested in figuring out. It is obviously another form of mobility at a time when we want to have as much uh, mobility as we possibly can. Sure. Uh, uh, we had one audience question of whether this will be available. Yeah, we're going to post this recording afterward, uh, I think later today or tomorrow morning. Um, Council Speaker, you also mentioned accessibility. We had some audience questions about Accessoride. Uh, does anyone know where that's at, uh, whether that's um, any changes have been made for that or any broader efforts to uh, help the elderly or the disabled uh, move around the city? Uh, I, I'm probably not the most well-informed person on this, again, just because I have so much in my head at the moment, but I'll say that I believe in Polly uh, or Phil can jump in if, if I get any of this wrong, because they may know it a little bit more than I do. I believe that the state budget shifted some money that New York City now has to spend a significant amount more on uh, providing for paratransit options like Accessoride. Um, and so, uh, honestly, I think that's a state responsibility because they're, they, they're the ones that uh, have the authority and control over the MTA. Um, so uh, they shifted, they took money away from us to be able to cover some of the costs. I'm not remembering the exact program. Polly or Phil may know a little bit more, but I know there was a program that was used for a while where people could use services outside of the typical Accessoride van that pulls up. And it was very popular amongst people that use Accessoride. It was, I think, a little more expensive, uh, but still it was very, very popular. And a lot of the folks that rely upon Accessoride really liked that program. And it was seeing a lot of uh, uptick in its use. Um, and uh, we need to provide every disabled New Yorker the ability to get around. It, it, is, it is government's fault that our subway system is not accessible, not their fault. And so because they can't ride an accessible subway system, they need to be provided with options that work for them to get them around. That is government's responsibility, is the MTA's responsibility, because it's mass transit is of course in their portfolio. So um, I can't give you an update because I'm just not remembering at the moment, but that's why I mentioned at the beginning of this conversation, why accessibility and why the fast forward plan were one of the cornerstones of it was accessibility uh, needs to be one of the main priorities moving forward. I see people saying that it is called e-hail and curb. I apologize for not knowing that, but I'll let Polly or Phil uh, fill in the blanks of what I got wrong or what I didn't know. No, no, I'll, I'll jump in, Mr. Speaker, and, and you got it right. Just to add, it is true, and, and look, you're, the city is, and I'm, I'm sure you can speak on this eloquently, I mean, we are facing a $11 billion budget deficit and counting, and, and the, the state passed a, several different costs onto the city. One of them is a, is a larger share of accessoride, and I think, look, it has long been a discussion 
uh, amongst elected officials and transportation experts at, at all the agencies that Accessoride, it, it, it's, uh, it's a very expensive service and customers have not always been very happy with it. They've had to wait a long time. There have been a lot of complaints about it. So the MTA did introduce, and, and it's quite costly. It's quite costly per ride, 60 or $70 a ride. So the MTA did introduce an e-hail program where you can use an Uber or a Lyft and it's on demand. It's, it's the kind of service the rest of us have and you would pay the equivalent uh, of a subway fare. And, and many cities are experimenting with this, but most cities that have done this have put some kind of a cap on it because even though the per ride cost is much less expensive, the demand goes up because it's, it's so much of a better service. So I, I know that the MTA and Phil may have something more to say on this. They had originally sort of done it as an uncapped program. It was unlimited rides that you could get at the price of a subway fare. I think like a lot of other cities, they just, they just sort of did the math and concluded, unfortunately, that if they opened that up to everybody on unlimited, it would start to be very expensive. So I think my understanding was, and this is since I've left the MTA, they have put some caps on it. And obviously now, I think at the city, state, and the MTA level, everybody is sorting through what the financial picture is going to look like for the next couple of years. I don't know, Phil, if, if you have more to add to that. Well, I think, Polly, you, you hit on it. The Obviously, um, you know, we have to evaluate all the financial picture, but I do know that at MTA and across all of our agencies, accessibility is a huge priority for us. Um, it's been something that has not gotten the attention it should have in the past, and we're very focused on it, whether it be eHale and Accessoride uh, or the accessible stations. And, and as we're looking at how to um, deliver capital work and how to improve service, all of those will be in every conversation because um, we're committed to it. Uh, I know Subways is committed to it, um, and we here at Long Island Railroad are committed to it. And just earlier this year, um, we added another uh, accessible station at Murray Hill, um, and we're proud of what we're doing here at Long Island Railroad, and I know uh, we're all focused on on these needs. Um, and it's, it's again, just, um, continue to stay and keep that in the dialogue because I think in the past it's, it's been um, not the, the main topic of discussion, but we know now it's a priority and it's, it's going to stay that way. And then Doug and Ian, uh, before we run out of time, um, you know, we raised this concept of what other global cities are doing, what other cities around the world are doing. Um, again, and, and both of you have work in other parts of, of the world. Any, any last idea, you know, here's what Paris is doing or here's what London's doing uh, that, that you would throw out as, as a solution to some of these issues. Doug, uh, first with you. Yeah, there was a reference earlier about what they do in London on nudging uh, the gamification of incentives and uh, loyalty programs. Heathrow's got a really top notch program that they are now thinking through how to leverage to encourage people to travel on off days, to travel at off times. Uh, so I think there's, you know, other than just the technology in the venue that is, you know, tracing and sniffing and looking and watching, there's also the human psychology of it of, you know, if you, you know, someone brought, you give them a cup of coffee if they go at a different time. Um, I think those are things that we didn't highlight a lot here, but we've seen work prior to COVID. Uh, and I think they'll continue to work after COVID. And there's been a lot of innovation in this space. And I think a lot of it will come to market pretty rapidly after the fact. Yeah. Yeah, I'd, I'd echo what Doug said. I mean, the, the the one that we're seeing most is how to leverage technology, especially the, um, you know, the app. Uh, Phil mentioned this several times. Um, if you're connecting a, a good journey planner um, to pertinent real-time information coming from your system. Um, Nudge, I think, will we'll catch on because um, if, if it's done in a very constructive way that's linked back to the service and also linked back to, you know, people's health, safety, getting there in a timely manner, um, people would love to have access to that information. Um, we haven't mentioned some things like, you know, account-based systems, which, uh, say, Omni is, is, is based on. Um, same for London, uh, same for Singapore and other places. And, you know, for people that do register uh, and, and want to get that, that level of information and, and get loyalty, as Doug said, it, it can give some added advantages for, for people when they're going through. And, and as we said before, 
you know, the impact of those billions of decisions, those micro decisions that will have an, a, an impact on the crowdedness of our system and when to take services. Um, I think that will be impactful as we're seeing in other cities around the world. Yeah, thank you, Anne. We're almost out of time. I just want to get our top audience question in. As schools are planning their reopening plans, the question of how children will get to school is a very important one. Many would be able to walk or bike to school, but their parents are afraid of how dangerous streets are. Are there any thought given to lowering speed limits in the city and finally installing cameras around every school, not only DOE ones? Commissioner? Yeah, so um, I'm gonna take the camera question first and go back to the speed limit. So I'm happy to say, I think we are already uh, um, now the city with the largest uh, speed camera program in the world, as far as I can tell, we have uh, per state legislation that was passed last year, been installing cameras, even throughout the pandemic, when, it, when a lot of my, my field forces were uh, working mostly out of home, we've been install installing 60 a month. And we have now gotten close to all the 750 school zones that the legislation authorized. We're gonna be going back and we do not only do DOE schools, just to answer the, the question, any school can qualify. We put them at yeshivas and parochial schools and you name it. So any, any school qualifies. In terms of the speed limit, some of you may know that back in 2014, the city was successful in um, getting the city speed limit, which was 30 miles an hour, lower to 25. And I also, by the way, I want to thank the speaker. He has been a big supporter of what we've done on speed cameras and helping to keep our speed camera program going when it, it lapsed up at the state level and, and a lot of our Vision Zero work. Um, but we were able to get the default speed limit lowered to 25. If we want to get the default speed limit lowered any further, and I know there's a lot of interest in doing that, some European cities have done it, we would have to go back to the state legislature again. It is an interesting quirk of, of sort of American jurisprudence that most cities do not control their speed limits. They are controlled at the state level. Certainly a, a, um, a discussion that I would be interested in having up in all. Great, thank you, Commissioner. Unfortunately, we are out of time. Uh, thank you to our sponsors, Boingo, Cubic Transportation Systems, and the Parkside Group. Final note, our Digital New York conference is set for July 23rd. It's fully online. Registration can be found on our website. And our sister publication, New York Nonprofit Media, has its annual OpCon conference, also all online, June 24th and 25th. You can register at nynmedia.com. Thank you to our audience for tuning in. And of course, thank you to our wonderful panelists. Thank you. And that can